It has been 10 years since we started the church, and we have seen God do amazing things, absolutely amazing things. And um, so the message that I have for this morning is, in a way, it's, it's bringing us back to foundation stuff, stuff that we know, but it's kind of reminding us of what we're all about, because I think it's something that we keep coming back to. And Scripture says, I remind you of these things, even though you already know them. So I'm not trying to tell you something new, but I'm trying to reignite something that should never go cold in all of us. So I have named the series, Everyone. Have you ever lost something important to you? How many of you have lost a phone? <laughs> um, a very horrible feeling when you're like, oh, where is my phone? How many of you have lost a wallet or your purse? And then you lose all the things that are in there, all the money that was in there, which is probably, you know, like people don't really carry much cash, but all your cards and your driver's license. It's a horrible feeling when you lose something like that. Or, or you lose your, your um, keys and you need to go somewhere and you can't find your house keys or your car keys or you can't find the TV remote because it's somewhere in between the couch. You know, it's a horrible feeling when you lose something. I remember quite a few years ago, I was at the beach with Paula and the kids and um, it was a hot, sunny day, and the beach was packed, and there were people everywhere, and it was just, you know, the holiday time. Good day to be at the beach. And all of a sudden, our son Jack was missing. He was just not with us anymore. And I remember I was, we, was, we were playing by the rock pool. You know the rock pool? And what happens is when the tide comes in, the, the water starts eventually washing all the way around the rock pool. And then it goes all white and murky along the sides, and you can't really see what's going on in the so the tide's coming and the waves are getting bigger. And I remember panicking because we couldn't find Jack. So I was walking around the rock pool and I was thinking, is he in the water somewhere? Is he getting washed out by the current? Where is he? He's, you know, like, can you, you know that horrible sinking feeling? So we started looking around and then strangers that we didn't know were like, we're looking for our son and we started searching and the people around us started to help us look. And then eventually we found him sitting with a group of kids or some other family. He was sitting there and he was ha happily playing, blissful ignorance, completely fine. But in that moment of losing him, our hearts were absolutely broken. We were torn. We were confused. And then he's sitting there and all of a sudden we run up and we're holding him and we're hugging him and we're kissing him and we're all emotional. And he's probably thinking, what? <laughs> They're very loving people. I don't know what this is all about. But, you know, he was completely oblivious to the fact that we were desperately trying to find him. And the people around us were obviously, they were happy and they were relieved that we found our son. But let me say this. If we had lost our frisbee we wouldn't have been anywhere near as anxious about finding it as we were about finding our son so if we were like all of a sudden we panic oh, guys please help us uh, you know i can't find my my slops please can we spread out strangers gather in they'd be like eh, you know it's 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 not so big we were panicking in proportion to our love for what was missing the point is this how hard we search for something is a display of how valuable it is to us. How hard we search for our slops at the beach is not going to be like we would search if we had like a diamond ring that fell off, which is going to be nowhere near what the kind of search would be if we had one of our children disappear. How hard we search determines what our hearts value. So the question is this, what about the heart of God? What does God value? And we understand that God values what he searches for. If we want to understand what, God, what is most important to God, then we need to understand what God is searching for. Today, we want to look at what Jesus tells us is most important to God. And I know you could be sitting in the room and you're like, I already know the answer to this. It's not about knowing the answer. It's about carrying the heart. Luke 15, verse 1 to 7 says this. Tax collectors and other notorious sinners often came to listen to Jesus' teaching, to Jesus' teaching. And we've looked at this many times. Jesus called the, the outcast and he called the rejected and he called the broken. And the word notorious means that you're famous. In other words, these people were famous for being bad guys. They were famous, they were notorious sinners. And Jesus is spending time with, with them. So in this crowd that's listening to Jesus, you could say there's two groups of people. They are the rejected and they are the religious. And the religious and the rejected are both sitting there and they're listening to the teachings of Jesus. This made the Pharisees and teachers of religious law complain that he was associating with such sinful people, even eating with them. 
Jesus loved, what's the, an Afrikaans word that says it better than any other language can? Kair. <laughs> he was the king of Kair, you know. He would just sit and enjoy eating together with people. And these people weren't people with the greatest reputation. These were the religious and the rejected. So Jesus told them the story. And, and a story is, in this case, it's a parable, which is just a story with a life lesson. If a man had a hundred sheep and one of them gets lost, what will he do? If I wrote an exam and I got 99%, I'd be like, eh, it's, it's, it's kind of sad that I didn't get 100, but 99% is a pretty good pass. I'm satisfied with that. If I had 100 rand and I lost one rand, eh, it's okay. Uh, if you invite 100 guests to your birthday party and 99 show up, you're okay. You're not going to be too stressed about the other one. If I had five children and I lost one, I wouldn't think, well, 80% is still a pretty solid pass, you know? Uh, let's, just, let's go, guys. We can make another one. To, to the listener, they could have thought 99 out of 100 is good. It's good enough. It's just one sheep. Then it goes on. Won't he leave the 99 others in the wilderness and go and search for the one that has lost it until he finds it? And when he has found it, he will joyfully carry it home on his shoulders. He's not furious and angry that it got lost. He's joyful that it's been found. When he arrives, he will call together his friends and neighbors saying, Rejoice with me because I have found my lost sheep. This is something that I want to gather the whole community around because it's worth celebrating. Now, the religious and the, um, the rejected start realizing he's not just talking about sheep here. It's talking about something else. Verse 7, it says, In the same way, there is more joy in heaven over one lost sinner who repents and returns to God than over 99 others who are righteous in heaven straight away. When something is lost, we want to find it. But when someone is lost and they come back to God, heavens erupt with praise. I'm hoping that as I'm speaking, something of the fire and the spirit of God will be birthed in our, in, our, in our lives and in our hearts again. Every day, the heart of God goes through our community searching for those that will respond to him through faith so they can be restored into rightful, rightful relationship with their maker. What makes, what makes us celebrate? If I had to ask you right now, what makes you celebrate? According to this text, what makes God celebrate is the person restored to rightful, rightful relationship with Him. Our church, going back to what we're about, our church started on mission to see lost people found. The goal was not a meeting, it was a mission. And we have a meeting, but it is to facilitate the mission. As a church, 10 years in, I want to remind us that we have exactly the same mission that we had when we first planted the church. We are still on that mission to see lost people found. So we started on Mother's Day in 2014, that's the correct date, and have seen people saved and literally hundreds baptized, friendships formed. We've had churches, people that have traveled to, go to other countries and churches have been planted, relationships restored, people healed, despite wave after wave of thing trying to sink us and rock us and shake us and do all the things. Yet the foundation is not built on a, on a an unshakable kingdom. Our mission hasn't changed as a church. Jesus is building his church and we belong to him and our call is the same now as when it started and we will continue on the mission because we want to see saved, lost people found and saved people finding them. So we're here on mission and we want to celebrate what God celebrates. So if God sees something as worthy of celebration, then we want to join in with what God celebrates and celebrate the same thing. And what do we celebrate is what God celebrates to know Christ and to make him known. Um, now, here's something to remember. Our church, this is so important. Get the heart of this. Our church doesn't exist for us. It exists for those that need hope and healing and help and direction and breakthrough. There are people in our community who are broken and they are hurting and they are suffering. And what they desperately need more than anything else is a savior to step into the world to rescue them from their sin and their struggle. The word God gave us before planting this church was that those who were in debt, in distress, and bitter in soul would gather. 
And either you are in that place, debt, distress, and bitter and soul, and you are coming through it, or you've come through that place and you're helping others through it too. But we didn't get a word saying, you know, that we're going to become this exclusive clique. We're saying this room is going to be full of broken people in desperate need of Jesus, and I'm one of them. Imagine a church that existed. Tyron challenged us with this when we were away. Imagine a a church that existed to attract God, not just people. So we said on a Sunday, the way I serve, the way I involve myself, the things that I do are an expression of welcoming the presence of God. And because the presence of God, here, the people will come. It means that we would have to celebrate what God celebrates and we would have to value what God values. And what God celebrates and what God values more than anything else is people moving from darkness to light, from lost to found, from death to life, from unsaved to saved, finding a kingdom community alive on mission because that's what we are. Different message. May God put a fire in us. There are two categories of people, sinners, And saved sinners. I understand that we are saints. I understand that we are saints. Yet a saint is a sinner saved by grace. So it's not these class of people. We are the exclusive religious better than those. And then there's those out there. We are all people in desperate need of a savior. And we want to go and give this good news to other people. As Christians, we've just realized how incredibly blessed we are to be found. And how desperately we need and continue to need the forgiveness of God all the time. Our goal isn't to get people into City Hill Church. It's to get people into the kingdom. And as we know, this is quite a powerful thing. I've shared it before. I've heard it before. We can love our church and not love Jesus. But we can't love Jesus and not love the church. We don't want people to love City Hill but have no relationship with Jesus. We want people to love Jesus, and because of that, by default, they'll love City Hill because it's what God's building. Today, on our birthday, we celebrate what God has done for us. We do not celebrate us. We celebrate the God that gives us life. He built us, shaped us, He held us, He fills us, yet we are not here to celebrate us. We are here to celebrate Him because God is awesome. I want to remind us today of what I spoke about earlier this year, and I know it's a different preach because I'm kind of... I want to share the heart of what we're all about. We've got that map there. Project 4126. Somewhere in that space is probably your house. And somewhere in that space is a whole bunch of lost people. Lost sheep. They are wandering around aimless and they don't know where to go. Our neighbors, our friends, our family members, people that, that we know are ser- that, that God is searching for the one. They are in that space and God has called us to be a fire that goes into the community and reaches those that need to be reached. And if we are a church focused on attracting God by celebrating what he celebrates and valuing what he celebrates, I mean what he values... Then when people come here, they experience God and their lives are changed and we together make a fire and the coals get put in and they get hot too. We are a lighthouse to this community. We are a city on a hill that cannot be hidden. So yes, we are on mission and yes, there's Project 4126, but it's personal because they're not just a project, they are people. And every single one of them has a name and a calling and an identity and God the Father wants to see them restored to their rightful place, which is in relationship with Him. We want to see a, a heart full of people instead of a hall. F- I mean, we want to see a hall full of people that have hearts full of God. My concern is that over time our hearts can grow cold. And we kind of lose the joy of our salvation. And then we go through the motions of religious duty, but we haven't got that same fire and passion and excitement and zeal for the church and for the things of God and for the kingdom. And every now and then you get those WhatsApps. I don't know, you know if you get those WhatsApps that say so-and-so has gone missing. Normally it's a teenager that's disappeared somewhere. And we can think to ourselves, well, you know, like that, it's, it's really stressful. It's terrible. It's so hectic. I hope that they're okay. I hope that somebody finds them. Yet imagine it was your child and they haven't come home. Now it's different. I would be rallying everybody I know 
and everybody I don't know in desperation to please help me find my child. It would be crushing me until at home. My child, made in my image, carrying my heart, is missing. There would be no limit to my effort to see them come home. And the point that Jesus is making is that being physically lost is one thing, but being spiritually lost is something altogether different. It's not losing the 1%. It's not losing the one. It's a soul worth everything. There is a scripture that's just been on my heart a lot recently, and it keeps coming up. And before I look at the scripture, I just want to show this picture. There we go. Beautiful, isn't it? A rusty old car. At some stage, that was a fancy new car. And it was somebody's, probably their, their, their joy, their prized possession. It was a symbol of success. Yet everything we own, no matter how excited we are when we get it, will eventually be old, out of date, broken, rusted, and gone. Matthew 6, 19 to 21. Don't store up treasures here on earth. Where moths eat them and rust destroys them, and where thieves break in and steal, store your treasures in heaven. Where moth and rust cannot destroy and thieves do not break in and steal, wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will be also. And I'm not trying to create a theology around what the treasures are in that particular scripture. Yet what I see in scripture is, is there is nothing in all of creation more valuable to God than people. And not just a crowd, but every individual that make up the crowd. Yet we spend so much time and money on things that essentially count for nothing. And they're very fun at the time and they're often very distracting and they have no eternal future. But we work so hard to upgrade and upkeep and get more. And we're missing out on the things that are most important, which is people. And I'm not shouting at us. I feel like something needs to be reignited in all of us. And the difference between the physical realm and the spiritual realm is that one is forever and the other isn't. One is eternal and one will fade away. And people are eternal. Everybody in this room, you are an eternal being. Eternally found or eternally lost. That should stir us. That's the difference between someone saying, Tim, your child is never coming home. Verse, we got them. They're safe and sound. Back in your arms. Welcome them home. And to, to lose a child in this life, and I thought about it, knowing that they are safe into eternity is better than spoiling them with all this life has to offer yet they are spiritually disconnected from God. The spiritual trumps the physical. God wants those who are his to return to his arms, and he's called us to go and reach them. Imagine our heart's desire as a church and as individuals. Above all things, the thing that we treasured most was to see friends and family and colleagues and neighbors eternally found and in the arms of a loving God. Not just churchgoers, but people on fire to see people reached We should be living for people. To love the Lord our God with all our heart, mind, and soul, and to love other people, safe and secure in the hands of a loving Father. What Jesus tells us in the scripture is that people matter to God, and if they matter to God, they should matter to us, and they are more than just a number. And because they're so important, we should devote our lives to reaching them. So our mission is to join in with his mission to search for those that are lost, pointing them to the Savior. Everything we have right now, everything you have, will get left behind. As Max Licardo says, it all goes back in the box. There's nothing you will take with you. The only thing that has eternal value is the people that we invest in. So today I want to mention two opportunities we have to join in on this rescue mission. Number one, create more room in our hearts. Holy Spirit, please expand our hearts for the lost. People are more open now, and this is coming across statistics and research and all the data. People are more curious and open now to spiritual stuff than ever before in history. They are open. 
They are people that we would never imagine would even consider Christianity are actually getting saved. And God is doing an amazing work. And people are getting saved. And people are searching. And they're asking questions. And they're looking, they are not looking for religion. They're looking for purpose and meaning and life and answers. And when they come to God, they're discovering that He holds all of those things. And they're getting saved. And think about this. What's scary is even though people are more open now than ever, Christians' hearts are more closed now than ever. I'm not criticizing you or me or anyone else there, but listen to this. This is my chaos has softened the hearts of the lost and hardened the hearts of the found. So we look at all the junk that the media is teaching, and we're getting more and more frustrated with their nonsense, and, their, and we're getting hardened to it. And those people are just desperately looking for an answer. Chaos has softened the hearts of, of the lost and hardened the hearts of the found. Now is not the time for the church to be silent. And when we do speak, we speak with words seasoned with grace, full of hope and peace and excitement. What is God going to do after the elections? Still going to be king, still going to be sovereign, still going to be in control, still going to have his church that he's coming back for. We are still part of it. We are still saved. We still have a mandate. We still have a mission. And it's to see people that aren't saved, saved. We are not here to tell people who to vote for and what our political views are. We are here to reach people with the gospel and tell them, despite who runs the country, our God runs the kingdom. He stands this morning at the door and knocks. For those that will open up. Now is not a good time for us to become an isolated click, living our disconnected holy huddle with only friends that think and act and speak and vote and believe the same way that we do. I feel that Jesus demonstrated this. He went and he intentionally reached out to people that needed, and he sat with sinners, and he challenged the religious to actually get up and go and do something. Imagine a friend was horribly sick, and you have the solution or the cure or the antidote, and you can make them completely healthy again because of what you carry, and they're sick. And then the cure that we've got, we've kind of like over time gotten used to being healthy again and we don't feel so bad about being sick. And, and even though we were given the cure and we were told freely you've received it, freely give it, yet we don't because we've taken our healing for granted. And it's too much effort to go and give the cure to someone else. If you are in this room and you are listening to this message, Jesus thinks you to die for. You are worth the effort to God. May God soften our hearts so that everybody is worth the effort to us. And the challenge to those that are Christian. If Christianity is in any way getting boring or routine or your faith is growing cold, I'm going to tell you how to reignite that fire so that you don't grow cold and that you stay on fire. We pray for, reach out to, bless those who are lost, and we speak to people about our faith. When we grow in faith and maturity... When we go, not just in what we know. And I I heard this thing and I believe it's absolutely true. If you have a 20-minute conversation with somebody about your faith and about who God is and what God's doing and how God's changed your life. And I'm not talking about Bible bashing and being weird. I'm talking about being a friend and listening and sharing your faith. 20 minutes of that will be more effective than 20 weeks coming to church. And it's not one or the other. It's both and. When we talk to people about our faith and we invite them to church and we invite them to come and see what God is doing, it ignites something in us. It's fine. When we pray, we should be praying now more than ever before. Please. (laughs) Uh, This is in my notes. I wasn't planning on saying this because... And then what we do is we do invite someone to church because we're hoping that they will respond to the gospel. And when we do, something happens that makes us feel uncomfortable that we don't understand. And then we think to ourselves, oh, no, why does it have to happen on the Sunday that I brought my friend? Now, that's written here. That's not like prompt you. Why the one Sunday that I brought my friend does Larry have to be doing cartwheels across the front of the church again? It, it, it inevitably happens. You know, I brought a friend and then this happens. If you are here, it's okay. If you are here and you think this church could really improve in the following area, instead of criticizing what can change, 
Rather, recognize the hole in the net and get involved and fix it. If there is a hole in the net, don't point it out and complain how people are getting in and out without anyone noticing. Go there and fix it and be the solution because we are the church. And what our job is to equip you so that you can go out and be effective in the world. Our lives lose purpose when we stop looking for the lost. And if you're going to church and you think that being at church is the main goal of your Christianity, then you've lost something because the main goal is to connect with God and see lost people found and bring them into biblical community. We are not the center of God's mission. We are central to God's mission, but we are not the center of it. And according to Paul, if we equip you, your goal is not to sit here and enjoy church. It's to take what you've learned beyond yourself and speak to somebody. And when you start sharing your faith, hey, guess what God did on Sunday? Or guess what God's doing in my life? Or can I tell you a testimony? Or my my son was sick and we prayed and God healed him. And you share that with people beyond yourself outside of this. Something stirs in you and a little fire starts. And then you come to church and you can't help it. And you've got a testimony and you want to worship God and you want everything everyone to know, and then more people around you start feeling the fire, and they bring their friends, but it's not going to happen if we don't go. Um, am, I, am I, I feel, Damon, God bless you. So number one, create room in your, in your hearts. Number two, create room in, our, in, our, in your homes, and I'm talking about our spiritual home as well as our physical home, you know, and I was thinking, but we could say this, oh, but it's, it's my home, and it's my space. And it's kind of mine, and I prefer it that way. And I I really do understand that. Yet I'm truly grateful that Jesus doesn't feel that way about us. In John 14, verse 2, he says, There's more than enough room in my Father's home. If this were not so, would I have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you? Just on this note, and this is so important to share, we are not a church uh, with life groups. We're a church of life groups. We want to care for people effectively. And if someone is not in a group then things might happen and we don't know. And therefore it comes across like we don't care, but we absolutely do care, it's just we don't know. And if you are in a life group and you are missing for two to three weeks, then somebody in your life group is gonna say, hey, we haven't seen you, and they're gonna reach out and they're gonna care. If you are not connected in biblical community, it's hard to effectively care. And then it might come across like we don't, but the truth is we absolutely, absolutely do. Biblical community is not the church's idea, it's God's idea. And we are part of a mission. This is, if you're taking notes, we are part of a mission bigger than our ability to achieve, yet not bigger than the God will use us, that will use us to achieve it.